Today we're going to be exploring the holographic model of reality and its implications for ourselves, our bodies, and the world around us. With me today is Michael Talbot, author of several books including Mysticism and the New Physics, Beyond the Quantum, Your Past Lives, and most recently, The Holographic Universe, as well as three novels. Welcome, Michael. Thank you, Jeffrey. It's a pleasure to be with you. Nice to be with you. You know, one of the things that you point out in the holographic universe is that this is a model that's been around now for a, a few decades, but right. it's really beginning to show its power in explaining many, many areas of personal experience and, and science uh, at the same time. Can we talk a little bit about how the model developed? Uh, sure. It was uh, developed by two two men, uh, University of, of London physicist named David Bohm, who was a pro former protege of Einstein, and a Stanford University neurophysiologist named Carl Pribram. And they worked independently. Pribram was studying memory and found that there's evidence that the brain operates holographically. And Bohm was studying uh, subatomic physics and found that on the subatomic level, the fabric of reality seems to possess properties that are reminiscent of a hologram. Mm -hmm. So if you put those two ideas together, that our brain seems to be holographic and the universe is holographic, it suggests that maybe it's compelling evidence that, that the universe may be a kind of hologram, not that it's literally a hologram, but that it's a good metaphor or way of understanding the universe. Now, when you say it's holographic, uh, what do we mean, really? Uh, that, in a nutshell, that reality may be more plastic and, and changeable, like an image, than mm -hmm. a solid construct, a sort of sticks and stones world, it has a couple of other implications, one of which is that a hologram has an unusual property. If you take a piece of photographic film that has a holographic image encoded in it, that means that you cannot see the image with your naked eye. You have to, to reconstruct the image, you have to shine a laser through it. So if you have an image of a rose in the film, shine a laser through the rose, you'll get a three-dimensional image of the rose on the other side. If you cut that film in half, shine a laser through each piece, you'll get a whole rose out of each piece, which is a very unusual property and sort of boggles the imagination at first. Uh, cut it in four, you get four roses. Cut it in eight, you get eight roses. Mm -hmm. So if the universe is a hologram, it means, as William Blake said, that quite literally you can find the universe in a grain of sand, that every portion of the universe contains some semblance of the whole, of the whole universe. That's very profound. Very. That's, I mean, that's, it's mind-boggling, and you know, one of the things that you point out in a footnote of your book that I would like to mention is that this doesn't apply for many of the kinds of holographic images that are popularly sold right, as yes. pendants and the like that don't require laser light. Right. Every, every talk I give, someone comes up and says they cut the, la you know, the hologram in half on their credit card and ruined it and didn't get the effect in it. It only applies to those images that you cannot see with the naked eye that you have to reconstruct. If you were to look at holographic film, it, it might look like ripples on a pond unless the laser light is shined through it. Right. It, it, you, there's no decipherable image in the film, it, and it very much does look like ripples in a pond, like when you drop pebbles into a pond. There are all sorts of little circles. In. They're called interference patterns. Right. The same as when you drop two pebbles in a pond and the and the ripples crisscross. That is exactly what is in the film. It's the crisscrossing of the laser light that's recorded on the photographic film. So there's the sense about a hologram that there's two levels. One is this three-dimensional image that's projected, and it can look so real that you want to reach out and touch it. And then the other level are these interference patterns. Right. That that reality in a hologram is, can be can manifest in two ways: as a concrete image, or as as this sort of in indecipherable blur of energy, and it, an, an analogy to this is kind of when you're watching Johnny Carson on your television set, that's really, his image is encoded in two ways. One is as the concrete image on the TV set. One is as the blur of, of radio waves permeating the living room. And if the universe is a hologram of some sense, in some way, it suggests that there may be two very drastically different levels to reality, that the concrete reality we see, you know, when we look at these chairs and at, at the, you know, the trees and the clouds and everything like that. Our bodies. Are, are just one way that reality manifests and that at some deep level there's another, there's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into a, an, a, an ocean of energy that is holographically interconnected where every portion of the universe is contained in every tiny area mm -hmm. of the universe. So that implies that this notion that, that we go about our everyday lives with uh, thinking of ourselves as separate from each other and the cup is separate from the coffee that goes in the cup, that, that these notions are, are, are somehow, what would you say, superficial or contradicted at a deeper level? Uh, they're, well, they're artificial, definitely, and, and Bohm really stresses this. And it, it's, it's a very interesting notion because in our Western way of thinking, we're so 
attached to the idea that when we come up with a concept, like a, an apple or an electron or whatever, that that exists out there and we forget, it's kind of like fish unaware of the water in which they swim, that the conceptual pigeonholes we use, words, to, to describe reality are phenomena inside our head. They're not out there. And most of the time, this is a philosophical quibble. When, but when you get down to quantum physics, and this is one of the reasons that Bohm came up with the holographic idea, it, it starts to have real effects. And one of those is it's been discovered that if you take uh, two subatomic particles like electrons, in certain instances, when you do something to one, it will always affect the other, no matter how far apart they are. It's kind of like stories that you've heard of identical twins, where when one is hurt, the other feels the pain. And the problem is, is that we can find no process known to physics that explains how these could be sending a signal back and forth. In fact, because it would have to be faster than the speed of light. Instantaneous. It would have mm -hmm. to be an instantaneous signal. And Einstein's theory of relativity said you can't have instantaneous signals because it would mean that you could uh, violate the time barrier and, and conceivably call your grandfather and tell him not to marry your grandmother. And most physicists say, well, this would be just too troubling to, to incorporate into a, a rational picture of reality. Um, Bohm explains it in a different way, which is a very interesting way, and he says, if you imagine that you've got an aquarium in which you have a fish swimming, you have a TV camera facing the front of the aquarium, one facing the side of the aquarium, and you have a monitor attached to each camera. Now you also imagine further that you come from a culture that's never seen aquariums, never seen fish, never seen monitors or cameras. All you are privy to is the two images on, this, on these screens. He says that maybe, you know, if you look at these two screens, you're going to see a fish, at, uh, a side view of a fish and a frontal view of a fish. And if you, because you don't know what the deeper reality is, the reality of the aquarium, you may assume that these are two separate things. And, but two different fish. Two different fish, two different objects. But every time one fish moves, the other is going to make a corresponding movement. Mm -hmm. And you may then jump to the conclusion that somehow the f one fish is signaling the other or communicating the other to say, hey, do this instantaneously. And Bohm says this is what we've done with subatomic particles, that we assume that an instantaneous communication is going on when that's not really what's going on at all. At a deeper level, a very holographic level of reality, every particle in the universe collapses to a sort of cosmic unity. They're not signaling each other. They're like that fish where there's the, the level of the aquarium. And so what that means, talking about words, is that there is no separation between electrons. Furthermore, there's no separation between people. And this has all kinds of very boggling uh, implications, one of which um, is that we've always tried to understand, for example, psychic phenomena, like how could I get information out of your head and my head as some sort of signal going back and forth. But if we're organized, if we live in a universe that's organized holographically, you no longer have to tackle it that way. It could be that I have the entire universe and every neuron, every cell, every atom, every electron in my head, and you do also. Right. So when we can access that, we can access information that seems to be beyond our normal sensory reach. Well, you know, I'm very interested in psychic phenomena, and I know you've had many personal experiences, right. and I, I want to touch on it, but this is not a model that was developed in order to explain psychic phenomena. I think to neuropsychologists like Carl Prebrum, the, the fact that it happens to uh, provide an explanation for psychic phenomena is almost a bit of an embarrassment, that he developed the holographic model because he was trying to come to terms with memory. Right, So let, right. let's talk about that. Sure. Um, Pribram was working under a, a very famous neurophysiologist named Carl Lashley, and it was at a time when it was believed that memory was stored in a specific spot in the brain, and there was something called the proverbial grandmother cell, that there was literally a cell in your brain that contained the memory of your grandmother, what you knew about your grandmother. And so they did a rather gruesome series of experiments for animal lovers, but it came out with some very profound uh, information. They took rats and they taught them how to run mazes. And then they would surgically remove various portions of the brain, Pribram and his, his um, mentor, Carl Ashley. The reasoning being that if they found a, if they could remove the, a, a portion of the brain and the rat could no longer run the maze, they'd found the area of the brain where the rat's memory of the maze running ability was encoded. Now, every time they removed a different portion of the brain, they discovered that they could never remove the memory of how to run the maze. They could impair the rat's ability so it might limp through the maze, but they couldn't remove it. And really, uh, you know, uh, surgeons had known this for a while, doctors had known this for a while, because when people have head injuries, they don't forget half of the alphabet or half of their family or half of a novel they've read. They have global memory mm -hmm. impairment where their entire memory may be hazy. But memories don't seem to be stored in our heads in the same way that books are stored on a shelf. And it wasn't until the 60s when Pribram encountered the holographic model that says that the whole is contained in every part that he said, aha. This may be what's going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. Specifically, because a hologram is made out of interference patterns, the hologram that you see 
you know, that we talked about earlier is made out of the interference pattern of laser light. But it can be made out of the interference patterns of any kind of energy, electromagnetic energy, electricity, uh, x-rays even. And so Pribram said since our synapses are constantly giving off electrical impulses, these are like proverbial pebbles dropping into the sort of electromagnetic pool of our mm -hmm. brain. They're sending out ripples that are constantly crisscrossing. And he believes that's what the brain hologram, that's mm -hmm. what, how we think and how we remember is through that hologram inside the head. Yeah. It would uh, apply in another sense too because if, if you take a hologram image and cut it in half or in quarters or in tenths, each time you reduce it in size, the image becomes fuzzier and fuzzier, even right. though the whole image is there, just the way memory would seem to be. In yeah, it becomes fuzzier when you have portions of the brain removed. Yeah. Correct. And Pribram then also uh, noticed that the same principle applied uh, for visual information processing. Well, yes, it's very interesting. He did not make the discovery, but he came upon the research done by other, res uh, other investigators. And that is um, another very interesting thing. Uh, as you know, Mother Nature uses all kinds of mathematical languages. That when mm -hmm. we go to understand physical phenomena, we generally find that there's some sort of mathematical underpinning to whatever the phenomena is. There are uncountable mathematical languages. It turns out that the mathematical language involved in the making of a hologram is a, a system of mathematics developed by a French man named Fourier. They're called Fourier transforms. Well, it also turns out that our brain uses Fourier transforms to translate visual information. And this is a very unusual state of affairs. It's kind of like discovering Eskimo speaking Spanish. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not proof that the brain is a hologram, but it's, it's suggestive that the brain is a hologram. And it turns out, in fact, all of our senses appear to rely on sort of Fourier transforms, that they all seem to use the same mathematics. So again, here's evidence that the brain uses the same mathematics to decipher the sensory world as are involved in the making of a hologram, mm -hmm. which is, as I say, not proof, but compelling evidence that something is going on there. Well, what this seems to suggest is a new way of looking at consciousness itself. Very much so, yeah. Um, it's, and it's an interesting thing. I, I have to say that I differ a little with Pribram because Pribram thinks that the brain, you know, as I said, that it's the electrical interference patterns in the brain that is a brain hologram. I'm a kind of a mystic because, you know, at a young age I had an out-of-body experience where I left my body and it became quite apparent to me while I was having this experience that I was thinking, but my brain was back in my body, which I could see in my bed. I knew it wasn't just a dream because I floated out over uh, the ground outside my family's house and I saw a book uh, on lying on the ground. And it was a book by the French short story writer, uh, Guy de Maupassant, and the next day a neighbor said, by the way, Michael, I lost a library book by Guy de Maupassant, have you seen it? And I thought, well, I floated over <laughs> it last night, I didn't tell the neighbor that, but mm -hmm. there, there was the book. And I, I was always very, I'm still very scientifically oriented, I want to understand the world in scientific terms, but it, it, it was the, really the first time that I sort of had to confront, you know, the difference between my spiritual beliefs that we can survive you know, the, our bodily death, and this deeply held belief, scientific belief of mine that it's the brain that's doing the thinking. And I realized it was, I had a kind of epiphany where I thought, I, it isn't the brain that's doing the thinking. So I, I am not entirely certain that, that it's just the electromagnetic interference patterns that mm -hmm. is the brain hologram, because those obviously would perish when the brain perishes. I think there might be some subtler level, mm -hmm. uh, some subtler energy that we haven't discovered with our technology that's involved in this also. Well. Bohm's model is uh, irrelevant and interesting at this point because he's not dealing with the universe as a hologram made out of uh, electromagnetic interference patterns. He's looking at quantum wave potentials, which are right. at a much deeper level. And, and I must say, I've heard Pribram discuss it much the same way. There are quantum wave potentials in the brain itself, which is, is a much more deeply embedded uh, level of energy and matter than, than the electromagnetic level. Right. Uh, Bohm, it's, it's a funny thing in science, um, uh, the great physicist uh, Herman Bondi said, called it the lure of completeness, that, that we tend, when we find some sort of outermost perimeter to what we can measure, we assume there's nothing beyond it. And I, I refer to it, it's kind of like the, the you know, in ancient times when we only knew a certain portion of the world, uh, people always seem to say beyond the edge of the map there be monsters, mm -hmm. that there was nothing there. And the same thing is going on in physics, that we have, with our technology, reached down to a certain level in, in reality, and it's a common prejudice among many physicists that beyond that level, there's no, nothing exists. There be monsters, there, there's just a void. Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting thing that, that we, as I say, we have to have this lure of completeness. We have to feel that our knowledge of the universe is all that exists in the universe. 
Bohman, I think, is very wisely is one of the few physicists who comes out and kind of says the emperor has no clothes, says what rational basis do, it's just prejudice that we assume nothing exists beyond this level of reality. Mm -hmm. And he feels that there are all kinds of, of domains of reality beyond this level, this microscopic level, and he theorizes that there may be untold, uncountable, subtle, subtler energies in these levels. The quantum potential is one. It's a theorized, a theorized field that has not been measured or discovered with science, but Bohm feels there's, there's evidence to posit its existence. And it's now rather well accepted, I understand, it, among quantum physicists. I, I wouldn't say that. Oh. I, no, it's, it's pretty controversial. And the reason it's controversial is because the standard explanation of quantum physics has bought, has decided that this lure of completeness, that mm -hmm. there's nothing beyond. Yeah, you know, the Danish physicist Niels Bohr, who's one of the founders of quantum physics, basically said, there's, you, you get it down to a certain level of reality and things become blurry and you can't know anymore. Mm -hmm. And Bohm takes a very different route, which at this point is very uh, sort of looked down upon by a mm -hmm. lot of physicists, because most have been schooled in the, the way of Bohr's thinking. Yes. And Bohm, the quantum potential is not looked upon kindly by most mm -hmm. physicists, I would say. Well, I don't think we want to get into too technical a discussion of quantum physics at the moment, but I, I do think it's important to bring up the uncertainty principle because it, it, in a way it's where physics comes full circle. And, and as I understand it, physics are saying, well, there may be all kinds of stuff, but we'll never know it because we interact with it. Anytime we attempt to look at particles beyond a certain level, the very act of observation changes things. Mm -hmm. and, and that brings us to a point where we realize that the distinction between subject and object breaks down. Right. But, they, but physicists get very funny about it. They get kind of schizophrenic yeah. because they'll openly admit that subject and object breaks down there. But they say that somehow this has no effect in the real world. Uh -huh. This does not translate from the microscopic level to our level. Although there is a sort of creeping uh, uh, evidence in the, the scientific world that it does translate into our level. Um, uh, one obvious example, I, I think, that it translates into our level is that helium cannot be frozen solid. It's, you can freeze mm -hmm. hydrogen solid, you can freeze you know, carbon dioxide solid, but helium, for helium the, the, uh, to go, to become its atoms to, to align in a solid form would violate the uncertainty principle, and nature doesn't seem to allow that. Mm -hmm. So you can't, no matter how cold helium gets, it remains a liquid. That, to me, if you, you can have a beaker full of liquid helium, and that exists at, at our level of existence, and it's, it's a sort of manifestation of uh, the uncertainty principle and it's where it's sort of slipped over into our world. There are other things uh, going on right now that where there's a, a device called a squid which is, is a sort of electrical coil in which it, it looks like we may be able to demonstrate that the current, if you say which direction is the current going in the coil, it's going both directions at once which is kind of an impossibility but to simultaneously do that. That, it, that too is a quantum phenomenon, that these two realities are overlapping. So I think we will cross that barrier. Well, I, I must admit, Michael, I'm not sure that I totally grasp uh, the implications of those examples, but the uh, examples I would like to focus on that do seem more relevant are the ones uh, that uh, suggest the enormous ability of the mind to affect systems in the body, uh, the placebo effect, uh, the work with uh, healing and visualization. Mm -hmm. uh, well, this, this gets away from Bowman into Pribram, but it's, mm -hmm. it's equally interesting with equally profound implications. Pribram, as I said, says that we're thinking with holograms inside our head, and that out there exists something that's more akin to the radio waves in the room from which your TV gets the image. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. And what we think is reality when we look out here is really just the image on the TV set inside our mind, but doesn't exist out there. And Pribram says this is why there's all kinds of evidence that we seem to respond, respond more to the models of reality in our head than out there. Uh, in, in the holographic universe, I give an example of a psychologist who did a study where he took soldiers and marched them all the same distance, but he told some they marched, uh, like he marched them all 30 mi or 20 miles, but told some they marched 10, some they marched 20, some they marched 30, uh, but they all marched the same distance. At the end, he took physiological readings and discovered that they were, that they're physiologically, they responded not to the actual mileage that they had marched, but to what they had been told, the model of reality that they mm -hmm. assumed they had, the, the reality in their heads. Mm -hmm. And in medicine, people have used this, this application of the holographic idea that we respond to the model of reality, to say this may be why we respond more to, um, to, to the placebos, to fake drugs, 
There's a, a very famous example of a fellow who had uh, lymphatic cancer, tumors the size of oranges all throughout his body. His doctor basically thought he had about three days left to live. The fellow heard about a new drug called Crebiosin and said, you've got to give this to me. And the doctor said, well, frankly, you know, I don't think you have long to live and this drug takes several weeks to take effect. The man implored him and the doctor gave in sort of as an act of pity. He gave the man Crebiosin and three days later, the man's tumors melted, as the doctor put it, like snowballs in a hot stove, completely gone out of his body, faster than the strongest radiation treatment could have melted them away. The man is up and around, walking around his hospital room, resumes his normal life, seems to be completely cancer-free. Several months down the line, he reads an article saying Crebiosin isn't that effective. Boom, 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 all his tumors come back. He's back in the hospital. The doctor starts to realize that maybe it wasn't the drug that cured the man, but the man's belief. So he lies to the man and he says, those articles are wrong. Crebiosin is effective and in fact, I've got an even more potent version of it. He injects just salt water into the man's veins. Again, the man's tumors melt away. He resumes his normal life. Unfortunately, many months down the line, he reads final studies on Crebiosin saying it's completely ineffective. Boom, 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 his tumors come back and he dies. Mm -hmm. But the, the bottom line is somehow this man had the ability mm -hmm. to access some deep level of healing himself. It wasn't the drug because salt water worked just as well as this alleged drug. And so again, here's an instance where he responded to the model of reality in his head, this deep belief that this drug would heal him, even though he wasn't even receiving the drug at a certain point in his treatment. And his body responded in kind. And that to me is the most exciting aspect of the holographic idea. And there are countless examples of it. There's a study of a new chemotherapy in England uh, where they took a group of cancer patients, half the patients they gave the drug, half the patients they gave a placebo, a fake, no one knew who was receiving the real drug or not. They told all the patients, this is a very toxic drug, may cause you to lose your hair. 30% of the people receiving just the fake lost their hair. And when I first heard this, I, I immediately thought, oh my gosh, about every donut that I'd ever eaten in my life and thought, oh, this is really bad for mm -hmm. me, that I'm, I may be responding to the model of reality more than, than you know, the, the nutritional aspects of the donut. Mm -hmm. Well, I think the uh, stories of this kind have been known to scientists for hundreds, hundreds of, of years, but they've kind of been dismissed because scientists haven't had a good way to look at the possibility that consciousness can affect physical systems. It, it, we think of consciousness as an epiphenomenon. Right. But if, if one considers that th there are standing waves, interference patterns in, in the brain, holographic images, it gives consciousness uh, a, a I hate to use the term mechanism because I don't think that's right. quite the right term, but it gives people a model in, in which they can begin to appreciate more the role of consciousness. That's true, and it also it can be applied in another way because if, if the universe is organized holographically, it, we've always believed you know, that there is no connection between the brain and the body, and of course, I mean, for most of the history of medical science yeah. in the West. In the past couple of decades, we're starting to say there's a connection and we're sorting out certain pathways, uh, you know, the neuropeptide systems, that sort of thing. But if the holographic model is correct, there are so many interconnections between the brain and the body, there ceases to be a division. Mm -hmm. So it becomes you, it, almost a, a moot point to say, what is the pathway? How is the brain connected to the body? Because there's no difference, just like there's no difference between those two electrons. Well, and, and to take it a step further, as you do, one might say there's no solid, clear-cut distinction between ourselves and the rest of the whole universe. I mean, this has profound implications for spiritual experiences, of which you've had quite a number, and, and perhaps in the time remaining we should touch on uh, more of those. Uh, yeah, very much so. I, as I said, I've always been very interested in science, but I also grew up in a very with a lot of very unusual experiences, not the least of which is that I grew up in a house with a poltergeist haunting. So I had all kinds of examples of psychokinesis, of objects moving about on their own when I was growing up. And um, I, it really was a, a strange uh, in the sense that for me it was normal and I had to learn that it was abnormal and rather painful learning. And as I grew up and my friends would find it very strange that these things would occur. Uh, and one of the things that Bohm says, because Bohm addresses the topic of psychokinesis, is again, we don't, you know, we may be mistaken to try to approach psychokinesis by saying what energy is leaving the brain to move the object. Because, as Bohm says, there's no l division between psychokinesis the Psychokinesis means mind over matter. Right, moving mm -hmm. the objects was just the power of thought alone. Mm -hmm. That we are as connected to that object as, as borderless, we're a continuum with the object as the patterns in a carpet. Mm -hmm. So for us to move the object may be, uh, Bohm says, just an act of resonance, of realizing that there's no division between us. Mm -hmm. And 
can we talk for a moment about the issue of uh, life after death or, or spiritual experiences of other realities? Uh, yeah, that's uh, one of the areas you had mentioned earlier that one of the exciting things about the holographic idea is that people have taken this and explored all different realms. Um, you know, that some have used it to say this is how acupuncture works because it turns out that there are little micro acupuncture systems where you can find the entire body in the acupuncture points of the ear. Recapitulated in, right. the, in the ear, yes. Right. <laughs> so that we've talked about the placebo effect. Uh, s some have said that the, uh, the holographic idea applies in near death experiences. One of these individuals is Kenneth Ring who is uh, at the University of Connecticut, studies near-death experiences. And it's interesting because in report after report of people who have been declared clinically dead, you know, go to some apparent other level of reality and then come back, they refer to this other level of reality with terms like frequency and energy and even hologram, that mm -hmm. it's a plastic, a more plastic level of reality where thought seems to create things instantly. There are instances of people having near-death experiences where they think they're hungry and instantly food appears. Or perhaps an even better example, when people find themselves out of their body, there are cases where people look down and see that they're in a naked body and they go, oh my gosh, I'm naked. Instantly they have clothing on. Now we don't assume that clothing has a soul, you know, that <laughs> it has a spirit that survives. So somehow it appears that the mind can sort of pull out of this ocean of frequency a hologram of clothing. And this is what Ken Ring says, is that we're entering deeper into the hologram when we have near-death experiences, when we, when we leave our bodies. So there's so many different areas that have kind of been at the, the fringes of our understanding that we can now begin to look at with, with new eyes. Mm -hmm. Michael Talbot, it's been a pleasure to, to have you with me. And for those of you watching, uh, you may be interested in knowing that this discussion will be part of a Thinking Aloud inner work videotape available along with an additional hour of discussion going deeper into these questions with Michael Talbot. Michael, thanks so much for being with me. My pleasure, Jeffrey. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets. So in essence, we're kind of conscious TV sets.